Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Butterfield, and I'm the project leader for the IPRO Care Transitions Initiative in New York. IPRO is the Quality Improvement Organization for New York State. And we're very pleased this afternoon to be able to provide a presentation on use of the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign materials and their application to care transitions and improving the patient and caregiver's experience as they cross over different settings within the healthcare continuum. This presentation today is being taped, and we do have throughout the presentation our email addresses. So if you have questions, please feel free to email myself or the other speakers, and we will be happy to answer any of the questions you may have or any provide you with any of the tools and resources that we've talked about today. We are going to provide a brief overview of the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign, and then the majority of today's presentation is going to focus on home health provider application of the tools to care transitions, and we have with us today two of our New York home health, high-performing home health agencies who are going to talk about their application of the tools and what they've done to date regarding care transitions. So with that, we'll move ahead today to um, Eve Esslinger, and Eve is the project coordinator for the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign, and Eve was very nice to give us some screenshots from the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign website, so we can talk a little bit more about that today, and you can actually have an opportunity to see how to register and log in. Today's presentation really is structured for folks that may not have had much experience with the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign. I do realize that a lot of you on the line have, uh, or listening to this presentation, have experience with the website, but we'll walk you through anyway just so everybody's on the same page. The Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign itself is really a grassroots cross-setting movement, and it was designed for all levels of cross-setting providers to improve um, home health quality of care that's delivered and improve communication and care coordination across many of the healthcare settings. And as you can see on that um, slide that we're on right now, the patient and caregiver are really at the center of all of this material, all of the focus of this campaign. And if you have not been to the website, if you notice on the bottom of the screen, there is the login information to get to the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign. This particular campaign is sponsored by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And this is really the second phase of the campaign. The first uh, started back in 2007, um, and this continues on from that initiative. Here we have a screenshot of the home page of the Home Health Quality, um, Quality Improvement Campaign, and for now I'll refer to the HHQI campaign. This is the website where you can go in, and you'll see two red arrows here that um, bring you to where to register. You only need to register your first time using the website, and we'll establish your information and your own password to get in on future um, times when you go to access the information. And then right next to that, you'll see the login. So from after you register, from then on, you're just going to go to the login screen, and you will be able to get in without any um, problems. It also has an area, as you see, if you need help with the password, if you do forget that. And we're going to talk about um, the other information in the other areas down here in just a little bit. The BPIP, or the Best Practice Improvement Packages, and these are the, the resource toolkits, if you will, that have the information and um, all of the topic areas that are focused on by the campaign for this phase. As you can see here, the first packet was available back on January 28th, and it really gave you an introduction to the fundamentals of reducing acute care hospitalization. From there on, it went to follow medication management, fall prevention, um, both which are big contributors to um, readmissions and emergency department visits. And from there on, since October, you have uh, cross-setting packages one, two, and three that focus on improving care transitions, aligning with other health care providers first, then looking at chronic care patients through disease management, self-management support, and telehealth, and then finally, just um, of late April 28th, the latest package, number three, 
as innovative ideas to help prepare for healthcare changes. And when you go into the website and you're navigating through the website itself and then you're downloading the best uh, practice improvement packages, as I mentioned, they focus on acute care hospitalization, medication, and then cross-setting, but they're really patient-centered, um, really designed as, if you will, one-stop shopping, interdisciplinary tools for all levels of, of, of staff that you have within your organization. It really takes you through standardized steps in utilizing the tools and resources, and most of them are posted there and available for in Word so that you can customize them for your organization, and it really gives you flexibility for implementation. And then, of course, if you don't want to use the tools and resources, but you already have your own, maybe there's a component of a tool or resource that's posted there that you want to incorporate into your current document or process or system. This is a screenshot of the actual best practice in intervention packages. This is what you will come to once you log into the website to be able to download each of those packages. And once you do click on a particular best practice improvement package, it will take you, this is an example of cross setting 2, it will actually take you to the different areas um, within the best practice improvement packages. Either you can download the full contents of the package, um, save it to your computer. Um, there's a nursing track, medical social work track, therapy, home health aid. There's um, sections that focus, in this case, on care transitions for the chronic care patient. And there's also success stories in there from home health providers throughout the nation that have shared their interventions, their implementation, their successes and challenges of implementing those interventions that are very helpful. There's also in each of the packages associated resources as well as web links that can bring you to different areas that provide additional information on that particular topic area. This is an example of cross-setting two if you opened up the full uh, resource section. You can see that there's a multitude of different tools in here applying to um, care transitions in English, in Spanish, in Chinese, various tools, uh, heart failure educational tools, diabetes, COPD, uh, part green and self-management support, toolkit for clinicians, personal health records, really a multitude of different resources that can be used within your organization. The other nice uh, piece of the HHQI campaign, as you know, your current OBQI or Outcomes Based Quality Improvement Reports, right now because of the OASIS implementation, those reports have essentially been frozen except for the process measures. So your outcome measures you really aren't able to gain access to to know how your organization, unless you're tracking internally, is doing on acute care hospitalization or oral medication management. When you go to the HHQI website, um, we'll talk about how to do the download of the report shortly, but you actually can access your acute care hospitalization and oral medication management outcomes measures. It will give you your actual agency data. Um, it's as current as data is available um, from the site, and um, it gives you uh, a uh, educational section on the site where you can actually see a webinar on how to utilize the data reports and it walks you through a description of those reports so that you're able to use them. Um, and this is a screenshot on the right hand side of your screen of what those reports look like. So there's a lot of information there. Um, they're individualized for your particular organization. No one else can go in there and download them to view any of your data. And because of that, if you are going to access the HHQI data reports, you need to, again, go in, register. You're going to establish a secure ID to obtain those CASPER reports or your OBQI reports for acute care hospitalization and oral medication management. And this is the icon that you're going to see on that home screen um, where you can go to a quick start guide to learn about um, registering and also how to utilize those reports. For the one time, um, this is separate from your registration to the actual website. This is specifically for your reports. You're going to have to go in and register. 
and you're going to have to go in and establish a secure login for your particular agency. And you're going to want to write down that information because each time you go in to download your reports, you're going to need to uh, reference that information. And once that you do that, there's the quick start guide, there's a description of the monthly report, and you can actually either view them online or you can download them yourself. So a little bit about lessons learned that are incorporated in the best practice improvement packages. The success, success stories that are in there, as I mentioned, are really from home health providers across the nation um, that have utilized these tools and have utilized the best practice improvement packages. Um, they have also um, highlight use of multi-provider meetings, coaching tools, educating staff, and best practices so you can learn from your peers as far as how they utilize the information. And what we're going to talk about today is really application of those tools and resources dedicated to care transitions. And this is really our second of two webinars that we um, have done for the Massachusetts Home Care Alliance. The last one um, back in March focused on um, improving care transitions. And today we're going to just go through some of those dilemmas as we focused on last time. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But we found in our work in care transitions in New York that there seems to be some dilemmas and drivers that are uh, causing readmissions to acute care hospitalization. What we find out is that the focus really is on the discharge versus the transition. The care tends to be very siloed in the particular provider setting that's caring for that patient at that time. There's no ownership of the transition. So there's a handoff from one setting to the other. And often there's communication gaps, care coordination gaps, and a lot of the burden is really placed on the patient. And we're talking about those chronic elderly patients um, that have multiple 13 to 20 different medications, many comorbidities, may or may not have a support system or family or caregiver at home, and really the burden is placed upon them at the time of discharge. Sometimes the caregivers, if they are involved, are not involved at the time of discharge. They're not included into the discharge planning or discharge instructions. Many of the providers have electronic health record systems, but a lot of them, most of them, do not cross walk to one another. So it's difficult to transfer information across settings. There's absence of cross setting medication reconciliation. Each of the settings has done a good job about you know, having an internal system, but once that patient leaves their organization, it's taking home health providers, as you all know, sometimes we um, three to four to five hours to reconcile medications. Skilled nursing facilities, we're hearing the same thing. But in hospitals also, when patients are coming through the emergency department, it's taking them quite some time to identify what medications that the patient is taking at home. Lack of advanced directives and screening for palliative care. And also looking at the reassessment of the patient and what goals that patient's been able to achieve at each transition and making sure that those patients have personal goals rather than goals that we as the healthcare provider have established for them. And then certainly the communication gap um, with the hospitals within the organizations. We hear from primary care physicians that they don't know their patients are in the hospital. Um, hospitals are trying to communicate, but there's definitely some gaps and one of the things we've been able to demonstrate in our work on care transitions in New York, most of the interaction um, between providers that are sharing patients is being done by fax. There's little or no verbal communication between settings. And what we've done with our providers is strongly encourage nurse-to-nurse -nurse report between the provider settings, and we've seen great, great success in instituting that open communication. There's opportunities to ask and answer questions. Some of the key drivers that we look at impacting transitions of care, as we mentioned, care coordination, communication, that medication management reconciliation, patient caregiver activation and self-management assessment. And how involved is that patient and caregiver? Do they understand what they're supposed to do once they go home? Assessment of patient and care goals at transition, and also information transfer across settings. And what we've seen as the foundation for success here in New York is definitely cross-setting partnerships, looking at putting the patient and res resident at the center of the focus of the discussion. 
uh, organizational self-assessment, what is going well within your organization, and also studying with those providers that you're sharing patients and residents with to see what is working well, what's not working well, and what can you do as a system to improve communication and coordination of care. Certainly senior leadership, a big foundation for success, multidisciplinary involvement, especially on the direct care staff level, focusing on process, not to setting, sharing learning, and really celebrating your improvements as they come, even the small successes. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next few slides because you're going to hear from the experts shortly, but these map to those drivers I just mentioned before. And what is listed on each of these slides are some of the resources that are included on the HHQI website and incorporated into those best practice of improvement packages. So related to care coordination, you have things like the acute care hospitalization risk assessment tool, um, front loading visit schedules, information on telehealth, telemonitoring, and also palliative care. For communication, there's SBAR tools in there, the Situation Background Assessment Recommendation Tools. Um, some agencies are using those um, to report in between disciplines and also um, using them to communicate with the physicians. There's stop and watch tool information, emergency department reports, and then cross-setting readmission review teams that are really sitting down and talking about those readmissions and what could have been done different to prevent that readmission. Medication management, there's a multitude of tools in the medication best practice improvement package, medication discrepancy tool monitoring. Um, this measures discrepancies as patients move from one setting to the other. It helps determine if the discrepancy was caused by a patient level or system level. And it also is unique in that you actually track and trend this information and send it directly back to the sending um, provider so that there can be some proactive um, concurrent review of what caused the discrepancy to helpfully prevent them from happening again. There's information on VIRS criteria, the potential interaction alert system, medication simplification tool, and also on medication management care planning. One of the other unique things our providers have done are partner with the colleges and pharmacy. I'm sure you probably have done that within Massachusetts also. But we also have pharmacy interns and students that are making home visits with some of the home care nurses and assisting with education of the staff and patients and doing up um, follow-up phone monitoring to ask patients if they understand their medications and also doing some education if they don't. There's also opportunities for community pharmacy collaboration and cross-setting patient educational tools available within the packet. Under patient activation and self-management, we have the red, yellow, green zone tools, emergency care planning, use of teach back, and also we found a great deal of success in doing beneficiary outreach focus groups to really get the perspective of what the patient caregiver actually perceives the care to be. They also have some excellent recommendations for improvement when you ask them. Assessment of patient and care goals and transition. There's teaching tools. Um, we have one home health agency that, or a couple of home health agencies actually, that have a case manager um, that's based in the emergency department so that when their patients come in, they're able to ascertain what actually happened, what was the cause of the readmission, and work together with that emergency department staff to prevent um, a readmission if possible. Um, we mentioned nurse to nurse verbal report and also cross setting um, referral teams have been very successful. So the HHQI best practice intervention packages, as we mentioned before, there's a leadership track to share with the leadership within your organization. There's also the interdisciplinary tracks, the tools, resources, and success stories. And also um, partnering with the community referral sources is really integral to the work that you do related to care transitions and designing and documenting an implementation plan on a cross-setting level so you can get um, started working on some of the areas that are causing readmissions. So you have my contact information here on the screen. You also have information on our IPRO Care Transitions 
um, website. And many of these tools and resources and, and additional tools and resources you will find. And I welcome you to access the site um, whenever you would like and download those tools. And certainly if there's anything I can do to help you, please feel free to email me. With that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our experts so you can actually learn from the folks that have actually taken this information and run with it. Um, both of the organizations you're going to hear from are um, really early adopters of the performance improvement initiatives and have had great success in reducing the admissions. Um, they really are the high performers, uh, some of the high performers within our state. And first, you're going to hear from Mary Jean McCagney, and Mary Jean is a nurse educator at Dominican Sisters Family Health Service. And with Mary Jean is Linda Stoll, who is the Director of Compliance and Quality Management. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mary Jean. Hello, everyone. As Sarah said, my name is Mary Jean McKevney. I'm the nurse educator with Dominican Sisters Family Health Service. Let me start by sharing a little bit about who we are. Dominican Sisters Family Health Service is a certified home health care agency. With over 130 years' experience, uh, we care for patients in all of Westchester County, New York, all of Suffolk County, and we also have a, um, an office in the South Bronx. We were recognized in 2010 as being, um, by the Home Care Elite, as being in the top 25% of home care agencies um, providing quality of care, and, and we were very proud of that as well. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share our Care Transitions program with everyone today. Basically, the flow of my presentation speaks to our process, our process of building our Care Transitions program and piloting it with one of our local community hospitals. I think we can all agree that oftentimes the most challenging part to any process is really just getting started. And my hope today is that by sharing our process and our resources and the invaluable support that we received on how we started small, we built a strong foundation uh, for our care transitions program that it might be helpful in um, helping you develop and implement your own care transition program. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, you know, the, the reason why behind all that we do, um, obviously, is the delivery of quality patient care and having the patient and caregiver at the center of what we're doing, to have them informed and activated meaning that they really understand what their health care needs are, that they have the skills and the confidence in their self-care management role, and that they can effectively communicate and have their needs met. I'm going to rewind a few years uh, back to 2008 when we started our process here with our care transitions program. We were uh, assessing our PI, PI goals and outcomes, um, our HHQI data and our home health care compare outcomes certainly demonstrated improvement in many of our PI initiatives like medication management, our wounds, and ambulation. But what wasn't improving was our acute care hospitalization rate, and we wanted to know why. What did we need to do differently, you know, to impact on this important quality measure? I actually brought that question. Um, back to a group of nursing graduate students, myself and three others. We were in class at the time and we were charged with developing an innovative curriculum addressing the need for healthcare reform. And we all came from different specialties. There were two of us from home care, um, a nurse educator from a hospital, and a nurse from hospice. And it really didn't take us long to figure out that we were all working really hard at our performance improvement um, initiatives and our national patient safety goals and trying to keep patients out of the hospital. And we were worked in a local community where we were all caring for the same patient, but we weren't working together. And as we looked around at each other, we realized that really didn't make a whole lot of sense. Next slide. 
and really asking the why and how we can improve our acute care rehospitalization rate and work together brought us to the care transitions intervention um, developed by Eric Coleman out in Colorado. And um, it's a patient-centered self-management model. It provides patients with tools and support that promote knowledge and self-management of their condition as they move from hospital to home. It has a significant patient to receive this intervention. There is a significant decrease in the acute care rehospitalization rate. And also, I didn't add it here to the slide, but there are also uh, patient and caregivers reports of increased confidence in their self-care management role. And I, how we came across the care transitions intervention was I made a call to IPRO after talking with the graduate students, asking for direction, support, um, any resources that could be shared in terms of a collaborative, innovative model that um, really kept the patient at the center across settings. And I, I spoke to Chris Segler from IPRO, who directed me to Eric Coleman, and thank you so much because it was really the beginning of our um, program. Next slide. So we got started work. We were doing our lit review, read as much as we could on um, the care transitions intervention. Um, IPRO, the nice scope of work, was a tremendous resource for us. All the research that was being done and the reasons why and how to focus on the implementation of the model was invaluable to us. We did receive training from um, on the care transitions intervention by Eric Holman out in Denver, and it was invaluable, really necessary part to um, the education that's needed, the training to really make that paradigm shift from the doer to the coach to really have that skill transfer take place between us and the patients and family caregivers. Without the training, uh, we would certainly not have been as successful as we are. And we knew at the time that with such an innovative model of care that there must be some grant opportunities, so we really sought out um, to see if there were any available for us. Next slide. So the first part of our process was answering the question of, you know, identifying our goals. And as you can see on the slide here, we really wanted to provide patients and caregivers with the tools and support that promote the knowledge and self-management of their chronic illness, particularly those key transition times from hospital to home and then from home to community. And we, were, we wanted to implement the evidence-based interventions to empower patients to take an active role in their care. Um, and that's centered around the care transitions intervention, and we wanted to execute those as well. We targeted our 30-day reduction of our 30-day hospitalization rate, as well as our um, ER utilization rate. And it was also really important to us to demonstrate high patient satisfaction with the um, care transitions intervention, as well as the patient personal goal attainment that we, we knew we were learning to partner with patients and family caregivers in a new way, and we wanted to make sure that we were um, accomplishing that. Next slide. So after establishing our goals, we wanted to identify our target population, and um, we knew that our heart failure patients were certainly um, a patient population that were being rehospitalized frequently. It was recommended to us from a group of physicians that we include pneumonia in our um, target population as it's very challenging at times to make that differential diagnosis when someone has heart failure and um, if they're having an episode of pneumonia. So we did incorporate that into our target population. We did specify that patients with dementia must have an available caregiver and it was for patients receiving home care that this intervention would be um, given to. Next slide. When thinking about your own target population, heart failure is certainly um, a good place to start. As you can see with these astounding statistics, heart failure is a serious public health concern. With almost 500 million people um, having heart failure in the United States, 
and 660,000 newly diagnosed every year. Now, this is something that, starting with this target population, you can certainly have a significant impact, as well as the direct and indirect cost of heart failure in the United States is $37.2 billion. So it's a great place to start and make an impact on your program. Next slide. So after our target population, we were thinking about, you know, identifying our care transition partners, and we do work with tertiary hospitals, um, but we decided to start small, and we identified a um, community um, hospital, and which one with which we had a very long-standing positive relationship um, for about 50 years. So we thought that was, would be a good place to start. And we also identified that we wanted physician champions, and we targeted the cardiologists due to our, the population of heart failure patients that we um, were looking to care for. Next slide. Again, we definitely proactively sought out grant funding on a local, state, and national um, level to help facilitate the implementation of the partnership between settings. We thought that would be a good strategy. Next slide. So we have our goals and our target population, and, and we identified our, our care transition partners, and now we have to market our program. And the care transition program presentation that we put together, I just wanted to um, emphasize that IPROs work on a nice scope of work and all of the research and the way that it was presented really aided us in aligning ourselves with our local hospital, as well as all of the research from Eric Coleman, as well as the um, NTOCC. And those websites, thecaretransitions.org and ntocc.org. They have um, plenty of wonderful information to use, too, and certainly IPRO was a big player in that for us. We did market our program before we obtained the grant funding. We were working kind of quickly to pull all this together, and we were able to sit down and meet with the hospital CEO and their executive team. Uh, we had a wonderful opportunity to meet with the chief of cardiology, and fortunate for us and for all the patients that we um, provided the program to, the chief of cardiology actually had um, one patient who had relocated to the area who had the care transition intervention in another state. And the doctor was so impressed with the tools and the way in which the patient utilized the tools to communicate his needs as well as his self-management skills. He was a real um, champion for us and was key in helping us um, open the door to speak to the physicians in the hospital. And he was a big player for us and a big part of our success. We were fortunate to receive some grant funding from the Long Island Community Foundation. All of our hard work paid off, and we went right back to our um, care transitions um, partners at our local hospital, and they were thrilled, and we started our program together. Next slide. Receiving the care transitions training as a coach and, and really making that shift from, you know, doer educator to real coach and partnering with patients in a new way where it's directed by the patient, identifying their goal and working from there um, is a, truly a, a paradigm shift in care. And we, after receiving the training, it takes time to grow and develop in that role. And we knew at the time that it would take, we were looking at six months to a year of really developing that role. But at the same time, we wanted to be sure that we were laying the groundwork for our staff education. And so we had our free care transitions intervention um, educational plan for our team champions. And the champions were selected very carefully, two on each team. And they, the characteristics 
that we were looking for were nurses who demonstrated success in teaching others, who had excellent communication skills. They were open, and they had case management expertise um, in addition to their clinical skills. So not everyone is selected as a care transitions coach, but um, those characteristics were certainly identified as key characteristics for um, the team. And so as we, the, the coach learning that role, you know, we were very involved in embracing that. And at the same time, we laid the groundwork for um, the clinical education on um, caring for the heart failure patient. And we have an innovative clinical partnership with uh, St. Joseph's College out in Castro, New York, with their RN to BSN uh, students as well as their graduate students, the clinical nurse specialists and nurse educators. And I can't speak highly enough for the value that that brings to our nurses. They came in and did a clinical needs assessment uh, on our nurses and caring for the heart failure population. They developed clinical practice guidelines, um, modules, education modules for the nurses. The graduate students um, provided simulation learning for us, utilizing the teach back method. Um, that ICRO um, has available, but they really did it in a competency-based way, and they focused on health literacy, again, building the foundation for um, the educational needs um, of our staff pre-CTI um, education. So we were very proud and fortunate to have that relationship with our local college. Next slide. Next slide. Great, thanks. So the care transitions tools, they're all, uh, they're available for all. We have them here on uh, ICRO's website is also on the caretransitions.org, the personal health record, the care transitions intervention activities, which actually specifies the focus of the patient caregiver interaction in the hospital, at home. Home, uh, the telephone calls uh, after that home visit is made. So it, it's very simple to follow, um, easily documented, very, very uh, effective uh, tool that we utilize. The patient activation assessment form, which identifies the patient's response to the coaching interventions, again, focused on the four pillars of the care transitions model of medication management, the personal health record, red flags, and PCP follow-up. And we utilize the medication discrepancy form. I know Farah had spoken to that. Um, it's designed to identify medication discrepancies across settings at two levels, the patient and the facility um, discrepancy. So that was very informative. At the same time, uh, what's very popular here with our patients as well as our staff are the, the uh, red, yellow, green zone patient educational tools for the patient's red flags. Very um, clear in terms of what to report and action to be taken when patients are experiencing different symptoms. Um, we also utilize iPro's phone monitoring guide, again, targeting, identifying those heart failure symptoms early and, and intervening as early as possible. And really, um, the teach back method that um, iPro has the information on really is invaluable to, again, beginning that paradigm shift of really evaluating patient uh, understanding of the education in there, meeting them where they're at so that they can effectively have an action plan to meet their needs. A very, a very helpful tool for us. Next slide. So we started small and we did get some very, very positive outcomes. Um, we, have, we had a 10% acute care rehospitalization rate for our pilot population, 20% ER utilization rate. We were very happy to see that we had high patient satisfaction ratings on the care transitions intervention as well as improved confidence in their self-management skills. That's really, we really wanted to see that as well, so we were really proud of that. Next slide. This is one of my favorite slides because it's, 
it, it's just all the points, all the lessons learned um, by implementing a small but successful program. And just to highlight a few, the care transitions training was critical to the success of our program. Again, it's a real paradigm shift in partnering with patients in a different way. And um, without it, we wouldn't have been as successful as we are. Starting small, you can achieve successful outcomes. Look at your process, see what you can, how you can build it and expand it to other diagnoses other than, you know, the heart failure. We're looking at incorporating uh, COPD and diabetes because it's a model of care that can really embrace all different um, chronic illnesses. We're, we were also last week just sitting down at a table with another partner um, talking about care transitions and how we can um, work together to implement, to have a plan to implement the care transitions program and have monthly meetings where we're actually talking about what we can do, what's working, what's not working, and how we can go about things differently so that we can keep the patients the family caregiver at the center of the care that we're providing. Very, very exciting. So starting small, you can have big successes. The physician champion that we had invaluable to us, um, you know, I would highly recommend, you know, going and meeting with um, a physician, whatever population you um, do decide to target. Um, very open to working and being collaborative and keeping patients out of the hospital and very open. And we were fortunate that the physician had such a big buy-in for the care transition intervention. Another area, education, education, education. That was something, it was continuous. So as we went and provided all of the training within the hospital on every level from case management to the staff, the staff nurses on the floor providing the care, to the managers and the supervisors within the hospital um, after we had presented to the executive team, and all of the departments within the home care agency, um, it was always about going back and talking about what we were doing, how we were doing, and the different stories of the patients that um, we were caring for and any way in which we could improve the care coordination and communication across settings. So we found that it was constantly, informally and formally reporting about our process and um, how we were doing. So um, that was certainly a big lesson learned. Staying connected in terms of growing in the role of transition coach, the care transitions intervention community learning call is invaluable. It's available to anyone who's received the training. Um, it comprises of um, transition coaches across the country, from novice to expert, all sharing resources and stories and, and such that really help you grow and develop into that new role. Invaluable for me. Um, really taking a step into embracing a whole new way of meeting the patient where they're at. I can't speak highly enough to that. I think our greatest teachers were on what we deem as our non-compliant patients. Rather than thinking of, you know, difficult to serve patients, non-compliant patients, they really had a lot to teach us about what it means to partner with them. And what came across more than anything else is that when patients are able to identify their own goal, and we help them kind of break it down into smaller steps and achievable steps that um, that is the key to motivation and self-management skills. That transfer takes place. It's really patient-driven. And um, the biggest surprise, a very happy surprise, but we it was really a great, they were great teachers to us for that. And so our lead in our encounters with our patients is that personal goal statement. What is it that they want so they can lead the way for their uh, preference for care? Tremendous learning for us. If you haven't partnered with schools of nursing for educational initiatives, um, it's an invaluable partnership that can provide really wonderful um, educational programs for your nurses. 
And lastly, but not least, the sharing our stories of success and challenges, celebrating the successes along the way with staff as well as our partners in, in the hospital, bringing back the stories to the director of uh, quality and discharge planning and really keeping those lines of communication open with our home care staff. You know, they were working on enhancing their care for the heart failure patient clinically. And as coaches meeting with them and talking about the coaching intervention, really laying the foundation for the power and the change necessary in terms of the um, care transition intervention and what it truly means to empower patients to take an active role in their care and to have that skill transfer so that they have the skills and the knowledge and the confidence to, you know, communicate their needs, to have their needs met, and to have those self-management skills that they need in order to have the quality of life that everybody deserves. So um, that, was, that was the biggest change that we provided for our staff in terms of building that foundation for um, the free care transitions training that they'll receive. So that's it for me, Sarah. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Mary Jean. I know the information that you shared and your success and how you got there uh, is very valuable to the folks that are listening and participating today on, um, in this session. Sarah, this is Linda Forrest. Yes, Linda. And I just wanted to um, put my two cents in here because I think one of the most critical things is having a wonderful leader like Mary Jean McKevney, uh, who has had this wonderful training in the transition program, and her passion and um, commitment definitely um, contributes to the success of the program. So I think that she's very humble <laughs> and wouldn't bring that up herself, but I think that's really been uh, very key to the success of our program. And knowing your organization, this is there. I know that the senior leadership is a huge support also. Um, Absolutely. So, so key. So key. <laughs> Definitely. So thanks so much, Linda. You're welcome. You can certainly hear the passion in both of your voices for the, the care transitions work that you've done as well as the patients and caregivers that are under your care. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, we're going to transition over now to Elaine Cannon, and Elaine is the Oasis Education and Outcome and Improvement from HCR Home Health Agency in Rochester, New York. Two perspectives, downstate, now moving up to upstate New York. With that, Elaine, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to begin with a little bit of a background regarding HCR Home Care of Rochester. It was established nearly 40 years ago, and we are located in upstate New York. Our child serves an average daily census of approximately 1,400 patients, and our very diverse population certainly is comprised of a large percentage of frail elderly patients with chronic illnesses. At HCR, we really are proud to have been recognized by Home Care Elite's Top 500 in the U.S. for the past five consecutive years and pleased that we are one of only 42 agencies nationally that has received that distinction. So i just very proud of that piece. Um, but we recognize that reducing our patients' avoidable rehospitalizations is really the number one priority. And to that end, we're utilizing as many evidence-based best practices that can provide us a framework and a structure in delivering the optimal clinical care to our patients every day. Next slide, please. So this is a list of really the best practices that reflect what we currently have in place here at HCR uh, to facilitate those, uh, those outcomes. And many of those that you see here listed are really going back to the fundamentals of the uh, HHQI campaign. So we're going to be talking about the specific risk assessment tool that we use, what our approach is in uploading visits, and a high-risk visit planning protocol that we use to help guide our clinicians and how to, how to really look at that high-risk patient differently right from the beginning. We're going to talk about our emergency care plan, 
uh, that we use here, we're going to talk about the zones for chronic illness management. We're going to be talking about our chronic care management, telehealth, telephony, and also uh, I'll touch on the fact that transcultural care is a big component of the care and the approach that we use here at HCR. Next slide, please. So we're going to start here with um, the patient screening assessment tool. Um, and we know that that tool is really a combination of the common risk factors known to increase our own patient population for the unplanned emergent care or readmit to the hospital. Um, we are also have slightly amended that tool, but I'll speak to that in just a moment. We, we really also will be pointing to the high-risk visit protocol as well as why it's so important to use the screening tool and then the overall risk, high-risk visit uh, plan in order to guide our care. Next slide, please. So this is actually the risk assessment form that we're using. Um, and again, it is based on some case mix, case mix analysis review. Pretty much it um, is really looking at what we know is commonly true about patients with chronic conditions, certainly COPD, respiratory, heart failure, cardiac, diabetic, chronic kidney disease, formerly referred to as unstable adrenal disease, patients with chronic uh, skin ulcers. The risk factors that we have amended to this actual tool um, are we've added depression in place of anxiety level that is every day or all of the time. And we also have added uh, poor health literacy to our tool. We, in, with our population, many of our patients have English as a second language, so it isn't just um, low English proficiency, but also it can be uh, English-speaking patients that really have an issue with health literacy. So it's really a combination of both. Next slide, please. So this is really our uh, high-risk visit planning protocol. And uh, as I said earlier, we developed it to really help guide our clinicians in uploading the visits and phone calls. Now, we look at all visits and phone calls. We also look at telehealth as a clinical contact. But if a patient is assessed to be at high risk, I want to point you to week one, which really kind of gives you that overview of what we would want to have is a minimum number of clinical contacts. Uh, but again, this is going to be based on your clinical judgment if you're the clinician out there doing that started care assessment or that resumption of care or even if we're looking at the patient at research time, again, reevaluating that. But let's just say this is a start of care and we're looking at week one. We really want the clinician to understand the importance of day one is, is the visit and then day two or day three must be the revisit. So the phone call would be brought in depending upon the clinician's judgment. If the patient really looked as though there were issues that needed more follow-up immediately within the very next day, we see the patient on day two. If the patient can be all right with a phone call on day two, but absolutely by day three, which is really only 48 hours after the start of care, we have that other uh, visit done. So we're really uploading visit one and visit two all within the first 72 hours. And then phone calls are then going to be spread out. But the overall view of the high-risk physical plan is really about um, not going more than a couple of days without a clinical contact. It's just very important that we keep a close eye on those patients because as we all know and as the data supports, patients have a high likelihood of going back into the hospital with, within less than 30 days. Oftentimes, those patients are going back in right away within the first week or two of care. So the uploading of visits is a, is a best practice that has been proven to reduce that readmit. And then in week two, we are looking again um, at a little bit less of a, of a visit protocol, but it's still a minimum of two visits and two phone calls in the second week of care. 
that the third piece of care, we're really encouraging our clinicians. And again, we're, we're always thinking about the whole medical necessity approach and the importance of understanding uh, your conditions of participation, looking at how long can we continue to see a patient that does not have uh, any health status changes. So we're, we're recommending that when you are in that, when your patient is in that third week of, of the plan that is high risk, uh, you're reevaluating whether or not there's ongoing need. So it's a good time for the staff to take a look at that whole big picture of the patient. And if, they're, if they appear to be not uh, with status changes and there haven't been any care plan changes or uh, changes in treatments, et cetera, then there's a, an approach of looking at the importance of planning discharge unless, of course, there is other uh, uh, payers that, that may be available to use if the patient was not acute and skilled. Okay? Next slide, please. Now, this is HCR's emergency care plan. I'm, I'm certain most agencies have a type of care plan very similar to this. And again, it goes back to the fundamentals that were on the HHQI campaign that dates back really to the early days of the campaign in 2007 when it first uh, rolled out. But it's just important that the staff uh, communicate to the patient the availability of our agency's 24-hour a day um, the ability to be able to triage any issues. So we've, we've got it broken down by, by systems of common issues. Uh, and certainly uh, at the bottom of the emergency care plan is reference to you would call your 911 for these items that are not considered life-threatening. It's important to, re to realize with our patients and, and have them see the value of contacting the agency first when they have non-life-threatening issues, to give us that opportunity to assess them, to uh, certainly triage the call, make the PRN visit as needed, um, certainly call the physician, we utilize an SBAR approach, and just be, to be certain that we're communicating that key issue. Next slide, please. So here we have our evidence-based tools. These are our zones uh, that really speak to, um, if you will, a red flag action plan type approach. So in this particular slide, we're looking at heart failure, um, and it's set up with the green goal. What does the go mean? And uh, the symptoms are well under control. And we realize that the green uh, area of the zone really helps as we get a little bit later in talking about chronic care management, how to work with your patients and helping them to understand how to make some smart goals, do some personal goal setting for their own, what they believe they want to make uh, improvements in their own health status. But the intention really of the zone is to key into the yellow portion, which is, of course, when the patients are beginning to have symptoms of concern. So again, it's that whole idea of we want the patients to call us first and to let us know when they're getting into trouble. Now, I would like to tell you that in addition to the heart failure, COPD, and diabetes chronic illnesses, at HCR we have also developed our own zones that relate to the management of pain, the management of wounds, and that was developed by our lead WOCN, Susan Bourne, and also uh, a zone that relates to um, the management of patients on blood thinners. It utilizes the same concept of the green, yellow, red. Of course, the red meaning then at that point, it's a call to the physician. This is a this is a stop. You need to call your doctor, or you may be calling 911. Remembering that our uh, our whole point in all of these zones is to teach our patients to recognize their own chronic illnesses because we won't be discharging them, many of them, at some point, and they need to be armed with as much information about this lifelong illness and how they can avoid going back into the hospital or at least be aware of when they should be calling their physician when we are no longer involved in their care. Next slide, please. 
At this particular slide, we're talking about telehealth, a very important um, piece of our clinical contact and our approach to reducing rehospitalization. Uh, we really began using telehealth probably about three years ago. Uh, it was used in a very small sample at that time. It was based on a Department of Health grant that HCR had received. And even with such a small sample of about 10 units several years ago, it was clearly evident of the value of telehealth. So with that in mind and armed with the uh, overall uh, plan of our agency leadership and the strategic direction, we know the importance of telehealth and how it can reduce uh, avoidable rehospitalization. So our, our plans are in 2011 to increase now our telehealth utilization and monitoring to up to 150 by the year's end. But an overview is really is just, again, again it's a self-management tool that we know that it, it certainly is keying in on things like blood pressure, heart rate, O2 stats, the weight, the BGs. There's also a series of health check questions that are specific disease management questions. So whether the patient had heart failure, COPD, or diabetes, there are a whole series of questions that are prompted once the patient actually signs in or begins their daily telehealth check. There is an overview, um, an oversight of the telehealth patients and their results. Um, by RNs within the agency, and the reports that we're getting, the customized physician reports have been extremely eye-opening and very valuable to our physicians, and really helps to support what telehealth is able to do. Um, we do have uh, our monitors in English and Spanish, and the plan is for our Russian-Ukraine popula population as well. And by the way, I do want to mention, if I didn't mention it previously, on the zones, I mentioned we have a very diverse population, but all six of our zones are available in English, Spanish, Russian, and Ukraine. Um, and again, just some of the benefits about the telehealth. We know it doesn't replace our nursing visits, but it certainly is that clinical contact, that touch to the patient that really helps us to see there's an issue uh, that is, uh, in fact, of concern, and then we can follow up with an in-house and an agency phone call to the patient and triage and send out that nurse for PRM visit. Um, we have always encouraged self-management in the home, and even prior to this expansion of our telehealth with a new vendor and many more uh, planned monitors for usage, um, we encourage any agency to start small with, you can pro certainly provide to a heart failure, heart failure patient a scale, an automated DP cuff, perhaps even an oximeter, to be able to begin to do some of that heart failure assessment, um, teaching and assessing from the home. So that's uh, pretty much how we're doing the telehealth at this point. It's a great tool and a great asset and one that we anticipate great growth. Next slide, please. And along that lines with the tele with the telephony um, we have here, which is really um, a standardized disease management format style. So we assess our patient as at high risk. We have said that it's important to upload those contacts, so both visits and phone calls. So in doing that, let's all approach this in a very systematic way with our patients when we're making those phone calls. And uh, in doing that, we're also incorporating the use of our zones. Um, it's important that, you know, we, we use our teaching tools in the many different ways that we can. And as you can see, this particular one really focuses on the heart failure patient and kind of goes into so those clinical heart failure guidelines that you would be narrow, you know, focusing in on the dyspnea, the edema. Uh, more difficulty in laying down the orthopnea, et cetera. So we use telephony as well as an important piece of the promoting self-management. Next slide. So now we're talking really about the care transitions manager, which is um, 
a role that was previously called a care coordination uh, specialist at HCR. But the care transitions manager, as we know, really it's a collaboration uh, with the two care settings and a whole approach to address the communication gaps that do exist. So we're trying to really tighten up that coordination of referrals. Uh, and it's timely sharing of the patient information that we know is so critical. I think we spoke earlier, uh, Sarah mentioned about the concerns and the dilemmas of the silos of information not being effectively communicated. So care transition managers are in our hospitals. Um, we have multiple CTMs in each hospital that we serve, and they really are there to help to facilitate as smooth a transition from hospital to home as possible. Um, and again, you know, just trying to increase the opportunity for the, the patient's understanding of the important talking points with their primary care physician so that we know that when they're at home, uh, what are the two things that are the most important. Let's take a look at the next slide. At HCR, we utilize a patient discharge kit, and within that kit, there is a agency, um, uh, well, the card that we have with agency local that actually is set up in, for the patient to use as their uh, primary care physician appointment card. We provide a Mediset. We have Mediset's right now in both English and Spanish. They're the very large size with the four possible times. So it's a big ready set, but we have found that that has been extremely helpful, uh, especially in our, our large Hispanic population that we serve. Um, there are cert certainly included within the kit tools for the safe administration of medication. So it's going to include um, some information that really tells them it's so important that you lift your meds, that if there's any concerns about the confusion in the um, the recon reconciliation of those meds from discharge that first few days at home, that it's important that these issues are written down and the patient is sharing that at the very first visit uh, with the start of care clinician. So they're already thinking as they're getting ready to go home what is so important in that first uh that, that first day or two as their home is, is making sure that we're talking about getting their doctor's appointment set up and that their meds are clear. Those are really the two big takeaways. Next slide, please. And here we're talking about our patient-centered community-based uh, care collaboration. And we're really looking at um, how we're viewing our overall special collaboration that we are developing is partnering with our local hospital and a geriatric physician uh, practice that's intended to have streamlined communication between the providers, and it's really a focus on increased coordination of services for our patients, where we are focusing really primarily on heart failure, CAD, COPD, and diabetes. Of course, our goal is to work collaboratively with these providers in preventing that 30-day readmission rate. At HCR, we also are noting that we have a long-term home health care program. Next slide. In the transitional care model here, we are really speaking about um, an evidence-based strategy, okay, that's really effectively transitioning uh, the frail and elderly from our hospital to home. Some of the leadership had the opportunity to go to Denver and to have training by Dr. Eric Coleman and to utilize his four-pillar approach. In addition to that, HCR has developed, based on the research of Dr. Mary Naylor, um, a specific role that really is a care transition specialist. So in this particular model, here at ACR, we are utilizing some geriatric nurse practitioners in this role that are advanced practice nurses that are going to be able to go to the, go to the hospital, meet the patient, once their choice, of course, meet the patient, review the 
the, um, the patient record and have that ability to begin to build some trust with the patient and to, to let them know that as part of this role, um, that the advanced practice nurse is going to be making in these certain um, patients identified, is going to be making that initial start of care visit. Um, there is that working together collaboratively with the care transition managers, the advanced practice nurse is in the hospital. She's communicating needs and issues of the patient to those folks, our CTMs who are doing the referrals themselves. Um, and it overall really is at a level where she is interacting with their primary care physician, um, doing follow-ups, doing um, increased communication, and really providing to the agency that ability to serve as a consultant. So the, the goal of this role is to really, you know, teach our nursing staff um, First of all, the importance of a really great, great assessment right from the beginning and then to take that advanced training and then communicate it to them as far as ongoing case management. Next slide. Here we're talking about the product care management uh, program that we, hear, that we have here at HCR. Uh, we are currently in the process of training all of our staff and certifying all of our clinical managers in chronic care management. It is a program that was evidence-based and developed by Baptist Health. I uh, just read here that Baptist Health did receive national acclaim with the Excellence and Innovation Award from the National Association of Home Care and Hospice in recognition of this home-based chronic care model. So we realize that it's very, very important for us to utilize this approach of setting goals with our patients. It's very patient-centered. It's asking that patient, what would you like to do to improve your care? It's helping them to set goals. We do utilize evidence-based um, tools such as our zones, which is our x ray mechanism. But as I said earlier, Yes, we use the green portion of the, of the zone, which basically gives that patient the opportunity to say, okay, let's start talking about the specific uh, nutrition and the um, diet that I should be on. Let's start talking about, if I'm a diabetic, uh, how often I could be do doing my blood sugars and how often will I agree to um, monitoring my overall diabetic situation. So we're using that whole goal, that whole uh, concept of SMART goals. SMART being specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive. Letting the patients work with you collaboratively to figure out what, what it is that they would like to be doing to help their, improve their own health. And again, as we all know, at some point, we discharge our patients and we want them to be armed with as much information about managing this chronic illness as we possibly can. Next slide. And again, just talking about the four pillars of chronic care management, you know, really kind of pulls together all the pieces. So we're talking about high touch delivery, the importance of the, a comprehensive assessment, um, that we're doing clinical contacts, that we're building trust with our patients, that there's those face-to-face -face visits, that we're proactively planning visits, that we're utilizing really all the things we've been talking about previously, uh, the best practices, that we're, that we're using telehealth, that we're using telephony, that we're, that we're doing everything we can to touch the patient as often as possible, that we're looking at theory-based self-management support. So again, the, the tenets of the health coaching, the importance of self-efficacy. You know, we want to build our patient's confidence level and knowledge level uh, as much as we possibly can. But we use a combination of motivational interviewing uh, within that model. 
that we are structuring activities that we believe the patient can engage in. I think when, um, our, when our colleague spoke earlier from Dominican Sisters about the importance of viewing that patient who's non-compliant or they say non-adherent is the term as being a problem patient, I couldn't agree more that the best success stories that you will have, that we have seen, is in if you can work proactively and collaboratively with a patient who has been known to be non-adherent because they finally feel engaged in the, in the way that they can do something on a small scale that is proven to be successful. And, you know, you could be talking about something as simple as the patient who's chronically, the diabetic patient who has chronic issues with very, very high BGs, and you can set a goal with that patient of uh, perhaps their, their issue has been with uh, drinking um, sodas or whatever that are very, very high sugar, and it's constantly impacting on that, on that, on that elevated BG. So you make that smart goal with the patient to say, for this week, instead of having your soda with full sugar every day, would you be willing to try reducing that by two or three days? Let's just see how that impacts on your blood sugar. So that whole idea of really just trying to engage the patient in setting their own goals. Last slide. Again, uh, the specialist oversight, as I spoke to before with the geriatric nurse practitioner, is a model that we're embracing here. It's the Mary Naylor model. And we really are hoping that this, that this um, advanced practice role is going to really demonstrate the importance of having that increased communication between our providers and that um, overall we're going to be getting uh, improved guidance to our clinical staff. Technology, again, another pillar, uh, certainly with the telehealth, the electronic medical record that's integrating our data across the medical community, dashboards and metrics that track our progress. These are all parts of the pillars of chronic care management that have really um, uh, a best practice that we're embracing here at HCR. I really want to say in conclusion, uh, I would like to strongly encourage all of you who are listening to this uh, presentation today to explore the Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign website, certainly access the expertise in our home health quality delivery that is provided by our own QIO, IPRO, who has seen the um, uh, www.ipro.org as well, an invaluable resource. The tools are evidence-based. They are best practices that you have the opportunity to really tailor to your own agency, to your own population, to see what really will work for you in helping for that ultimate goal, that improvement of the quality of life. All of our patients want to be at home. And we can do so much. There's so much that can be done to improve that potential for them to remain at home. I'm happy to hear from any of you. If you have questions or comments, um, you can certainly contact me or send your questions to me directly or through Sarah. I'd be happy to speak with you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Elaine, for those words of wisdom. Couldn't have said it better. And uh, certainly when I was on the HHQI website today, uh, I was looking to see they have the number of participants and providers. And so far there's 8,523 participants from 4,753 providers um, that are part of the HHQI campaign. Um, so if you haven't had an opportunity to go to the website, um, or if you visited the website and you're, you know, you're listening to Mary Jean and to Linda and to Elaine today thinking, how can we possibly do this with everything else that we have going on and that's already in our plate? I would encourage you, just as you heard today, and we've seen 
um, work successfully for the providers working on care transitions with us, start small. You know, start with one patient. Start with two patients. Start with one nurse within your organization. Press the tool. Start one tool at a time and spread it and, and grow the population that you're focusing on. And once you, you're successful in one area, then you can move to the next um, so that you don't find it so overwhelming. And the other uh, issue that I want to sort of address, we talked about on the last webinar, is really the opportunity to partner with your referral sources, with your hospitals, with the school nursing facilities within your community. Um, often we hear that that is the most difficult thing to do, to actually get to the table with those folks that you're sharing patients with. And as we stressed on the last call, the opportunity is definitely out there now as hospitals are having just as you've had since 2003. In 2009, hospitals um, began having their uh, acute care hospitalization rates for a acute myocardial infarction, pneumonia, and heart failure publicly reported on the hospital compare website. You've heard discussions about changes in Medicare payment, looking at bundling of payments. How that's going to be modeled, we're not sure yet, but hospitals are, are now looking to work with the providers in their community to reduce readmissions, to improve the quality of the care coordination in improving communication. So certainly there is an opportunity now um, for that dialogue to begin. Whether you are having a difficult time getting to the table with your hospitals, it certainly if you package together what you've worked on for care transitions, any of these tools that you've put in place, and you're able to go and present this information to them, any improvements in your future hospitalization rate, your emergent care rate, those are wonderful opportunities to showcase that you've had success with the program. And even if you're just starting, and you're going to be looking at risk uh, assessment for those patients. That is it also an opportunity to meet with the hospital and to work on that together, um, and certainly an opportunity to get to the table and dialogue uh, to really strengthen uh, the programs that you're going to be working on. So certainly, care transitions, no matter what national program you go to, um, is a high topic area, big focus across all payer settings, whether it be manage Medicare or manage Medicaid. Medicaid or Medicare, all of the payers are looking at reducing costs, improving the quality of care, and reducing preventable readmissions. So certainly the time is right. And as Elaine and Mary Jane said, I would encourage you to visit, take advantage of the HHQI site. It's free of charge. All the tools and resources are available free of charge. So it's an excellent opportunity. Certainly if you have any questions, um, as you heard, any uh, requests for additional information, any of the tools and resources, please feel free to contact us and we'll be more than happy to help. And you also have the um, MassPro, the Massachusetts Quality Improvement Organization, who are excellent resources to you also. So with that, I thank you all for joining us today. And uh, good luck on your care transitions efforts and utilizing the HHQI campaign to have a successful program. Thank you for joining us.